This picture represents you. So it's all yours. Take Thank it you, away. Sir. This picture represents you. I'm Mitch. This picture represents you. There is uh, currently something blocking you from your objective, your goal. Do you happen to know what your objective, your goal is? Some of you, it might be an airplane at 830. Some of you, it might be friends, family. For some of you, it might be other things. I am currently your impediment. I am your blocking issue. I am your roadblock. I am preventing you from getting to your goal. And that kind of, come on, that kind of, that kind of sucks, right? It's like, oh my gosh, how long is this guy going to talk? The good news is, is I got it down to two hours. <laughs> oh, I meant 20 minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, Who's, who's heard the words rattling around at their company's business agility? Anybody? Yeah, business agility. Anybody got any idea what that means? Because I got no friggin' clue. I'm going to talk to you about it, tell you what I think it means, but what does it mean? Does it mean faster? Does it mean guarantees, no bugs? Does it mean quality? Does it mean all sorts of stuff? All right, so... So we'll discuss in this session, we're going to look at a bunch of stuff, but we're going to discuss two things. Now, of course, the title of the talk being Business Agility. This is business. This is agility. All right? Because everybody loves fluffy dogs. So we'll talk about business. We'll talk about agility. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> How was that one? All right. Um, <laughs> I'm Mitch. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, I know two days of mind-numbing agile saturation is a lot sometimes. I know it's fun. I, I like it. Uh, thank you, Oz. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, uh, Alok and Ashley and everybody else who put this on for organizing a great conference. Um, thank you to all the speakers. You guys rock. I had an opportunity to hang out with some of you, and I got to know some of you, and I promise no Canada jokes. You're welcome. Um, my family's all Canadian, too. So this is a little bit about me. I, I wrote a book called The Scrum Field Guide. I've been doing this Agile stuff for a long time. I've got the, the racing stripes to prove it. Um, I've ran the Agile conference before, 2012, 2014. Big, big conference always in North America, it seems like. So like you, I probably, you know, you, we probably have some similar experiences in the fact that what drove you to this, to, to, to practice this, to try this, to experiment with this, was probably some sort of very large catastrophic failure. Anybody? Large catastrophic failure where you had to put your tail between your legs, go into your boss's office and say, I am terribly sorry, I just lost us millions of dollars or millions of something. I screwed the pooch. Anyone? Who's been in that? Nice. So just four of us. Excellent. So everybody else, right, you guys take names and kick ass. Love it. Look, hire, the, hire you four guys, hire everybody else. Right? So, so I've got the alphabet soup, all this hoo-ha, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, but just, you know, I've been around the block and I've had my ass kicked a few times, unlike, unlike everybody else. So, I got this talk broken into three parts. We're going to talk about part one, which is complicated and complexity because everybody loves the C word. Uh, then we'll get into some other stuff about organiz organizational structures and then we'll figure out how to flip the bit and make all this business agility crap magically happen, okay? Because remember, agile is nothing but what? Legos, hugs, and unicorns, right? Hugs and Legos and unicorns. So a little bit of a survey, please. Think about your company. Think about your customer. Think about what you do. Is it complex? Anybody? Is it complex? Yeah? What is complex? Because that was a, over half of us. What is complex? You heard me say, I call it the C word, complex. I don't know what else that would be, but the C word to me is complex. Say again. I hear some, am I hearing things? No? Good. All right, so somebody did say something. Here's what I think about complexity, right? Uh, what is this called again when birds do this pattern thing? I remember how it works. I always forget the name. Memoration. Murmuration, thank you, thank you, yeah. That's a big word, I'm an American. So, you know, I got that going for me, right? Murmuration. And it, it's funny if you, fa it's fascinating if you watch this, if you study this, if you just read a little bit about it, right? 
it's, it's you get these, these little pods of birds and they all communicate. So it's like I got seven, eight, ten birds, right? I got some of my best friends. We're all hanging out. We're all going to go that way. Uh, but if one other person wants to go that other way, this other little group, this other little pod, this other little team starts moving and it sort of just is a ripple effect throughout. It's a beautiful thing. To me, this is, this is erroneously complex. This is a very big, complex system. The interactions are, ex are, are, are increasing exponentially at, at every second of time. The interactions are in increasing. Let's say, for example, that we misuse the word complex. Let's say that what we really mean is something else, maybe complicated. Let's, let's just plant that in the back of our head for a minute and, and cruise around. Because complexity occurs when things become unpredictable. And as we know, drugs are predictable. Like a good American, I should probably take something for my high cholesterol. I don't. Anybody? High cholesterol, high blood sugar, any, any other sort of, yeah, where it's like the doctor says, take two of these and call me in the morning, and you're like, cool, problem solved, right? I can do whatever I want now. So we think about side effects of drugs, and we look at side effects of drugs, and you go read a drug bottle, or you go read the thing, you know, in the States we get this, this eight pages of crap where it says all these problems are going to happen. And I read it, and I'm like, you know, that's, that's nice. It doesn't apply to me. And it's like it's, it, I'm not going to get ovarian cancer because I don't have ovaries, I think, last I checked. But again, I'm an American, right? Anatomy was hard. So uh, with one drug, it's easy. With two, it becomes challenging. With more, it becomes even more challenging. There's a little link at the bottom of this page, which you can't read. Uh, Stanford professor Russ Altman, he, he, he looked at big data. And, and the FDA publishes all sorts of side effects. So, that, so they look at hospitals. They look at, they look at data. And they parsed it out. And they started asking questions. Well, hey, let's, let's take a look at you know, what happens if this, inter if this interacts with this. What happens? Because we have all sorts of data that this drug does this, and that's cool. That drug does that. That's cool. But what about if these two drugs get together? It's like, hey, SARS, I'm MRSA. How are you? Superbug, right? We want to avoid things like this. So he started looking at this. He started looking at this data, and it, and it became pretty fascinating. So he looked at two things. He looked at a cholesterol drug, and he looked at an antidepressant. I forget the names. They both start with P. I don't take either of them, so I don't really know. And what they found that when, when these drugs were combined, they started looking, right? So they'd look at people, they'd look at a time frame, and there was a very small sample set. They, looked, they, they pulled data from Stanford, they pulled data from, uh, uh, I think it was Harvard, some East Coast schools, right? So four or five very large databases, Vanderbilt was one. They looked at this and they said, oh my gosh, when this is combined with this, blood sugar, blood glucose goes up. 20 dec deciliters, deciliters, goes up. But when alone, it's fine. When alone, it's fine. When combined, your blood sugar's screwed. Well, imagine if me, a person with high blood sugar running right around 100, if all of a sudden I started taking cholesterol medicine because I have cholesterol of 280. And I started feeling depressed. So, of course, any good doctor will say, here, take these pills because that'll solve all your problems. And my blood sugar spikes. And I'm like, why am I diabetic all of a sudden? This doesn't, my diet hasn't changed. My exercise hasn't changed. I eat healthy. I try to. I just ate the gummy bears. That was a good lunch, by the way. All right? And so, you know, you look at that. That's a big change. That's a big impact. And that's just two drugs. What happens if we expand our, our set? What if it's three? What if it's four? What if it's five? Because we could look at, you know, what they looked at was, well, let's test A to B. Let's test A to C, A to D. And, you know, we can look at these patterns. There's nothing out there yet that can look at this, this giant database and go, all right, you know, we've got, we've got people around the world that are in this age bracket, this category, and they're getting, they're getting, they're getting drugs left and right. Their doctors are prescribing this, they're prescribing this, they're prescribing this, to fix all these problems that they have. And these people, like, we're, we're the test bed. So I have a friend who's a drug researcher, and she's a chemist, and, and she, you know, she, yeah, I do this, my job is to fill, and it's like, that's totally cool, but you work with other people, and do you like, hey, what happens if we throw all that crap in a pot and see what happens? No. Does it turn brown? Usually, it's a general color, but... You know, so now we start to see complexity. Now we start to see if if we have a. Some of you might have a family member like me who's probably above seventy. They might have some aches and pains. They might have some pills they take. Whether or not they remember to take them is an entirely different story. But what if they take this, this, and this, and that starts driving forgetfulness? What if it starts driving blood sugar? What if it starts? Thinning out your blood. What if, what if, right? And there's all these combinations that we look at. Now, this is pretty dire, and this is pretty depressing, and drugs suck in general, but there's something that's significantly more fun that we all deal with on a regular basis, traffic. 
Anybody deal with traffic? Yay, traffic, okay? So we look at this picture here and we're like, oh my gosh, this sucks. We are in the wrong lane. I want to be on the other side because those people, they're moving. We look at this and, you know, we're not moving. Now in the U.S., unlike other, like other places in the world, right, we have controls put in place. We have controls put in place that tell us how fast to go, when to stop, when to turn, when to signal, when not to, right? We have dedicated areas for all sorts of different things. We see, we see here we have crosswalks, right? This is your space, pedestrian. You're allowed to walk here. You're not allowed to walk here because that's where the big death wheel roller things come from, otherwise known as cars. But you can go here. This is your safe zone. If you get hit here, sue the person. America, right? So we see traffic lights. Traffic lights tell us when to go. Traffic lights tell us when to stop. They tell us when to slow down. This is a control-based system, and it's a control-based system under the umbrella, under the guise, under the premise of safety. Because you know something? Who, who drives? Anybody drive? Yeah, we're all too stupid. We're all too stupid to know when to stop. Oh my gosh, look, there's a cow in front of me. Let's hit it, let's hit it. No, that's not a good idea. How do you know? You've never done it before. Uh, right? Okay. Let's cross the intersect. Let's drive on the sidewalk, which might be okay in some parts of the world. Probably not here. Probably. Notice the, the disclaimer. I've driven here. I liked driving here. I like driving here. It scares the shit out of me, which is good. <laughs> which is good. Right? It's like, ugh, life. In fact, I feel like I should go rent a car tonight and see how slow I can go. Right? All right. So we look at this, right? We have all this stuff in place to ensure safety. So there's this, there's this theory, there's this idea, this concept being tossed around. Some cities in the US have it, some cities in Canada have it, some cities in Europe have it, called a shared space. This is actually in the UK somewhere, I forget where. I should have written it down. Where all of a sudden, all of a sudden we see a blending of, of, of lines. We see, we see pedestrians, people, we see bicycles, we see motorbikes, we see cars, we see trucks. They're all sharing the same space. They're sharing the road because, because what's allowed and not allowed to happen becomes blurred. In this one here, it's pretty straightforward. You stop here, you go when the light changes, you know, if, if X, then Y. Pretty straightforward. Here, it's kind of one of those things of, if X, then I'll think about it. So, first developed by a Dutch dude. I like the Dutch, they're really cool. Any Dutch people in the room? Very direct. When I said, does anybody know what the C word is? They gave me an alternate, alternate answer from complexity which was fun. Um, Hans Monderman, okay? Now, here's the thing. And I kind of agree with this, right? People will figure it out in a civilized fashion. People will figure out how it works in a civilized fashion. Right? We don't need to, say, we're pushing responsibility down to the lowest level, to the accountability where it belongs to people on the road. We don't need to assume or automatically say, oh, you're too dumb. You're too dumb to know when to stop. You're too dumb to know when to go. You're too dumb to know what, how fast is, right? We have to have all these regulations in place. Uh, there are states, there were states in the United States where there were no speed limits. In fact, those states where there were no speed limits, you can still have no speed limit because there's no police for 500 kilometers, which is pretty fun. But consider this, right? So here's an intersection in Hanoi. Has anybody been to Southeast Asia or other parts where things like this might become true? You notice some interesting things here. Look at those people walking. Look at the people, the guy up top with the oranges on his bike. Notice how they're just going straight. They're not looking over their shoulders like I did when I was there because I was petrified that I was going to die. They're just cruising along. We see the dude up there with the oranges. He's walking across, right? Hey, it's cool. Nobody's going to hit me. We see the bikers going around and we see the cars stopping. Here we see a release of control versus the other picture I showed you in the States where we see imposed controls. Thou shalt do this because thou shalt not be able to figure this out. Now, when I did go to, to Vietnam, I was there and I did walk through an intersection like this and I'm looking and somebody walks up to me and an expat, he goes, dude, you just go. And he goes, whatever you do, don't stop. And I go, why? And he says, because you're going to screw everything up. Because... If you stop, if you stop, then all of a sudden, 
the whole system breaks down and people don't know what's going on because you're supposed to do this. You're not supposed to stop, you idiot. You're supposed to just keep going. And I'm like, all right, all right, leap of faith. I can totally do this. Indiana Jones, right? Anybody see Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, right? <sighs> Off I go. It's a total leap of faith. And I got to the other side. I'm like, yes, that was fun. Let's do that again. All right? Who's experienced this before? Anybody? Yeah. It's a good time. It's a good time. It takes a little courage. Now, of course, there are some detractors. Let's say there are some detractors, right? Here we see a car going into the intersection. We see the bike going into the intersection. We see those damn kids screwing up everything, and everybody starts freaking out. So Rob Emery, Goldsmiths University. Right? To me, the principle is wrong. <coughs> People in cars don't mix. Wholeheartedly agree. I don't want a car as an object. I don't want one driving two feet past me. Yet we saw in that video, not only cars, motorbikes too, and people were cruising. Now here's the thing. The studies and everything show that Shared spaces improve traffic flow because people slow down. It reduces accidents. It reduces hit and runs, deaths, whatever you want to call it. It reduces it because it, it pushes the accountability and the responsibility back on the people that are there versus on the, the government, if we want to use that word, or the city manager, or the lights and the intersections and the boundaries and the lines and all that sort of thing. It's on us. You go in there and something happens, you screwed up, right? You, 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 you crash a red light, Arr, you know, it's the finger pointing game that gets. There's all sorts of things that get mixed up. But here's the thing. Is for me, this is about education. It's about educating people to understand what are we trying to do here? What is, the, what is the goal? And if we apply this, start applying this to software, we start thinking about our business, right? It's about goal setting. It's about boundaries. It's about pushing accountability down. Because ultimately, what we want to do is we want to create an end-to-end -end system, an end-to-end -end team that has accountability, responsibility, maturity, ownership, and we want people to deliver stuff in a, with a high degree of quality in a predictable fashion. Is that, is that fair? Is that too much to ask? Now, here's the thing. Complex systems aren't predictable. Complicated ones are, so we'll sort of we'll noodle on that. Anybody read this book? Yeah, a few of you. Friggin' awesome book. Awesome book. Uh, go buy it. Uh, General McChrystal, he led the task force in Iraq 2000, I don't know, two, three, four, all the way up to, his job was to rid the world of Al-Qaeda, or at least Iraq. Now, he outlines a model for complicated and complex type systems. Okay? So here we see something that is a complex system. He visualizes it like this, where we have a whole bunch of interactions, a whole bunch of things happening at different times. And he'll assert, that thing, he'll assert that things like an ecosystem is complex. The Great, the, the great Barrier Reef in Australia, it's a complex thing. Right? Weather patterns, birds like we saw, large-scale economies. These are complex things, right? They have a large number of interactions. If a variable changes, something else changes down the road. So the butterfly effect. Has anyone heard butterfly effect? What happens if the butterfly does something in Antarctica? What happens, you know, what, does, does somebody's beer not pour in Alaska? That's a, my own variant, but that type of thing, right? Nonlinear change. If there's a minute thing, we see dramatic shifts. Any Star Trek fans? Yeah, all right, so this is, this is Kirk stealing that Klingon battlecruiser. Around the world he goes and goes back and saves the whales. Yeah, not a good example, but we all know about time travel, right? Back to the future. There we go. All right. All right. Marty. Marty. Okay. So we often think about our worlds as complex. This is complex. This is complex. But, you know, what if we were to stop and think, well, maybe our work is just complicated. What if that given time, things could be broken down in such a, in a, in a predictable way where we could have some degree of certainty? Because all our customers ever want Right? All our business people, want, they just want predictability. Is that fair? Software people, software, who are my software people? Who are my people who get stuff done? Yeah, we lie. <laughs> we lie. We say things like, yes, you can have it at the end of the day. Yes, it will be ready. Yes, we say yes, and then we insert the lie after the word yes. And then later on, when it's more stressful for us, we come back and say, sorry, I was wrong. 
You should have known better. Yeah, well, I know, I know better now. Well, why didn't you know better then? I did. You just didn't want to listen to me. You know, how can your estimates be wrong? Well, because predictability is hard, especially about the future. Niels Bohr, good nerd porn right there, all right? So this is how McChrystal visualizes a, a complicated system. We have a series of inputs. We have a series of flows. We have a series of actions. And things happen. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It can be broken down, and you can predict, and blah. And that's, and that's fine. Whatever the screen says, that's fine. But I build big systems. I work at a bank. I work in insurance. I work in healthcare. I work in telecom. Insert something big here. It isn't predictable. It isn't complicated. It's complex, and it's a big old friggin' mess. I will assert that it's not a mess. It's just... You just don't know where all the garbage lies, right? Which is a different problem. This is a knowledge problem. This is an information problem. Not a complexity problem. Because it could be predictable if we wanted it to be. So how do we make it predictable? Well, my truck is predictable. I, start, I turn the key, the engine starts. I, it's a controlled environment. I hit the brakes, it stops. Most of the time, it's old. That's 25 liters per 100 kilometers, by the way, if you ever wanted to know what that looks like. Okay. An engine. We might look, who are my car, anybody like cars? Old cars, new cars, cars, cars? Yeah. I look at this and I could name off 95% of the parts in here. Can anybody else? Would you struggle? You might go, it's complex. No, it's complicated. It has a, right, it behaves in a controlled and predictable way. This happens, goes in here, fire, 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 boom, 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 car goes fast, police pull you over. No, sir, I didn't realize how fast I was. Oh, there's a speed limit. Crap. Sorry. And you beg for forgiveness. So, complexity and complicated. Now, let's take a look at some company structures, business structures, because I'm sure we all have some fun stories with regards to how our companies are structured. So, show of hands. Um, what do our companies want? What do our customers want? Or not even show of hands. Give me some answers. Yes, please. Oh, microphone. Yeah. Microphone. I can repeat it too. Are those two questions or one question? One question. Um, Consider company or customer. Use it interchangeably. Okay. Um, they're different for us, I believe. Um, our companies want more money. Ooh. Companies yeah. want more money? Yeah. Okay. So profitability. Yeah. Anybody? Company want, wants profits. Company wants money. Uh huh. What else? They want to hear the word yes. They want to hear the word yes. Yeah, don't tell me no. No is not an option. Failure is not an option. Mission accomplished. All sorts of fun things like that. What else? Predictability. Predictability. Yeah. Your company wants predictability. Your customers want predictability. How about stability? Anybody? Stability? How about reliability? How about quality? How about put a Y on the end of anything? Right. It's kind of like, yeah, we work on every day that ends in the letter Y. Uh, satisfaction? Satisfaction. What is satisfaction? I don't remember where you are. What is satisfaction? Is that like, is that like, I'm not going to say it, my mind. This is, a, this is an instance where this part was going to do something, and then this said, no, 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 and it actually worked. <laughs> so it's like, uh, for, for what I'm using uh, your product, it does that with the reliability or not. Yeah, yeah, it should, it should do what you say it does, and it should work well, it should be reliable, it should, I, I shouldn't lose my data over it, right? It shouldn't have security flaws, security issues. What do you think the company, what else might a company want in order to achieve those things? What does the company want in order to get that stuff? What do they put in place? What did General McChrystal have? Think about, think about any military organization. You're the general, who are you? Leadership. Hmm? Leadership. Leadership, oh, that's a different debate. Who does the colonel report to? Who does the lieutenant report to? Who does the captain report to? Right? That is a control structure. That is called chain of command. You smile, you say, yes, sir, and you say, how high would you like me to jump? 
right? You ever see that at work? Nobody's ever seen that at work? I got to come work here. Because I see that crap all the time, right? I see that crap all the time. Now, there's a variety of things that cause reliability, predictability, stability, all that stuff to happen. There's a variety of different things. A lot of frustrations that we go through, right? There's a perception that we're resistant to change. Anyone? Anyone? Are you resistant to change? Or do you think people maybe believe that? Yeah? Okay. Your boss or your CEO or somebody, our quality sucks. We need better quality, right? You're resistant to change. Why are we so damn slow? How come nobody's happy? We do these surveys every six months and the scores come back terrible, but nobody does anything about it, right? And everybody complains. So what do we do about it, right? Why does this happen? Well, it happens because the leadership teams, the executives, the CEO, they're not clear. They're not clear on a variety of things, right? One is, what's our identity? What are we doing? Why are we doing? Who's our customer? What are we going after, right? What's our identity? They don't engage us in figuring out what that identity is. They just assume that because I think it, through the power of the force, everybody now understands, right? My young Padawans, right? And then instead of pushing for change, like, let's figure out how to solve this problem, we do this instead. We do a reorg. Anybody been through a company reorg in the last three to 12 months? Let's see, show of hand, this is a good one. Lots, lots. Is it a fun experience? It's not, why not? I like it, you get the opportunity to have a new master tell you what to do and tell you how you, you will be <laughs> successful. Right, you sit there and you say to that person, can I do it like this? this? Is how I've always done it. No, that way is awful. Do it like that. What's the difference? It doesn't matter. You should listen to me. I'm your boss, damn it. And you're going like, son of a bitch, son of a bitch. How am I going to feed my family? So we come up with all sorts of wonderful command structures that look like this. Now you can, I let the cat out of a bag on a, on a, on a notice, notice. Remember we talked about that last night? Yeah, okay, good. I'll tell you later. Um, we look at this and we go, and we go, all right, I'm the dude at the top. I am the big box. I am the big square, and I have my direct squares. And then they have their direct squares as well. So if you've ever had a, you know, a, a, a square of squares meeting, or I'm going to go meet with my boss's boss, I'm going to have my skip level or my skip box or my skip square. That's really what it is, right? I'm going to have my skip square. All the control, all the command, all the information, everything is at the top. And the people who have to get stuff done, they don't know any of this stuff. They don't know what's going on. They're just told, do, it, do this. Yeah, but why? You don't need to know why. Or if you do need to know why, you won't understand anyway. It's above your pay grade. It's above your level. You're here to execute because you are a resource, damn it. Right? You are a little widget. Your job is to... Be the resource. Don't be a human because, you know, humans are live sentient things. Be a damn resource. That TV is a resource. It's my slave. My slave. Okay? So, we, we missed the target. We missed the target because the business is, you know, here's the goal. Here's what we're trying to achieve. We reorg. People are disempowered. They're not able to make decisions. They don't understand the goals or the objectives of what we're trying to achieve. And the organization on a whole fails and collapses. And then we get into a very awful cycle. What do we do next? Reorg. You got it, baby. Because clearly that didn't work. So let's restructure again around this myth of false identity. Because we don't know what our identity is. So let's reorg again because that will fix all problems. And then, of course, we, the people, we're like, yeah, but that wasn't fun last time. I didn't like the boss that I had. They sucked. I like my boss. Can I go back and work with that other person? No. No, they're not allowed. They've been promoted to management. There are now two boxes above you, and you're just a lowly little square box. They're kind of like a rectangle. Oh, yeah, I've always wanted to be a rectangle. Nothing beats being a rectangle on an org chart. The circles, now they screw everything up because things just slide off. But at least with boxes, we have structure. All right. So, the change is announced. No matter how good we think it is, it sucks. And people are negative. Right? People start going, 
well, what about this, and what about that, and how does this work, and blah, 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 and it's like, you're just resistant to change. We went through the reorg for you. This was for your benefit. Why do you got to hate us, man? We're, we're looking out for you. We just restructured everything so that you could be more efficient, not productive, not, not anything else other than, you know, efficient to me is kind of like busy. I'm very busy. What'd you get done? Nothing, but I was very busy. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you go to a meeting and you pack five minutes into an hour. That's a, that's a good meeting right there, right? Yeah, so we, we, we raise our issues, we raise our concerns, like why this, why this, why this? How dare you ask, right? How dare you? You should know, blah, blah, blah. I'm the leadership team. We hold all the power. We hold all the knowledge. You're the resource. You're going to do what's, uh, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, our customers suffer, our employees suffer. The organization starts failing. Now, in sort of researching this, and one of the things that I had forgotten, I liked this book, Flawed Advice and the Management Trap. It's an older book, and I always screw the author's name up. So we'll just go with Chris, whatever it says. A Grieger, I don't, I'm, I'm going to butcher it. He calls this Model 1, right? Model 1 is based on you should be in unilateral control. You should win and not lose, right? You should hold back your feelings, your emotions, and act rational. How do you act rational when you're emotional? How do you act rational when it's like, I don't understand this. doesn't matter. Do what I say. You don't need to understand. And so instead of dealing with all this stuff, what we need to do is we need to, we need to shift. This is, this is command and control. This is self-fulfilling prophecies that we believe are going to give us that goal that we're trying to achieve of predictability, stability, quality, all that stuff, right? Follow the milestone. The control will save us. Nothing beats a good old project plan. So what we want to do is we want to shift. This is one of McChrystal's quotes that he did in a TED Talk, which I, which I just loved, right? We want to shift. We want to shift from knowledge is power, which I'm sure some of us might have grown up with, me included, knowledge is power, to sharing is power. Because who cares what I know? It's what do you know? And are you open to tell me what you know? Hey, I'm open to tell you what I know, provided I have the maturity to do it. But together we're stronger, individually we're weaker. And so he transitions this. He says, he says, we have this model where we move from a command structure to a command of teams structure, where the goal is to build empowerment. The goal is to build accountability. It's to build ownership, and it's to start driving the decision-making to the lowest end of where it should be with, with the people doing the work. Empower them, give them what they need to do. And then the ultimate goal, he wants to transition to what he calls a team of teams. Now, how many of you have heard of Scrum at this point? Hopefully more than, more than most of us, right? Because you probably heard about it earlier today like 50 times. Right? Team of teams, right? So a Scrum team is cross-functional. A Scrum team has collective ownership. All this stuff, same thing here. And this is, if you go read... Team of Teams by McChrystal. This is what you'll see. This is what was causing the task force to lose. This is what was causing the army to lose against Al-Qaeda. And it was a shift in thinking. We're approaching it from decision-making being at the higher levels, and the people on the ground are, are sitting around for minutes to hours waiting for instructions instead of doing what they think is the right thing. And if you think about that from your business, how long does it take somebody to make a decision? Is it minutes? Is it hours? Is it weeks? Is it months? Right? If you're waiting on your CEO or your CTO or you're waiting for some dude to review a, a hardware budget to be able to say, yeah, this is what we have to have in place to get this project out the door and it's got a six-month procurement time and it takes them four months to read the damn email, you're screwed. Whose fault is that? Yours, baby. So we want to create a team of teams, right? We want complex interactions to bind the group. And then we want to scale that out. So similar like that flock of birds, I got that little flock of birds cruising along. There's seven of us. And if I hang a left, my buddies might hang a left too until one of them hangs a right. And I'm like, hey, yeah, totally. I, we should hang a right. Now we might not all go. The, our little group might change. But the total communication throughout that flock remains the same. And we see those beautiful patterns and those beautiful waves. So what do we need to do to make this team of team stuff happen? First, we've got to rely on each other. 
because we're, we're thinking about these are complex interactions, not complicated. These are complex. We want to rely on each other. We want to know each other's strengths and weaknesses, which means you're going to have to be open and you're not going to allow to be an asshole all the time and say, I'm right, you're wrong. We know that person, right? Those are called teenagers. Anybody have teenagers at home? Yeah, there you go. There you go. I'm right, you're wrong. You know that, you know that person at work, too. You know, they don't look like a teenager, but man, you sure think about it that way. We've got to know our strengths and weaknesses. We've got to anticipate and decide quickly. We don't have time to wait for it to go up the command chain of command and then come back down. We don't have time to wait for the boss's boss's boss to do something. It's like, we need decisions now. And if we choose not to decide, here's what's going to happen. Here's the negative impact of not deciding. Because remember, not deciding is still a decision. Okay? And as a responsible leader, as a responsible executive, my job is to articulate that vision and make sure that everybody understands it. And clear all the roadblocks possible in order to make that a reality. Because again, all I want is predictability. I want quality. I want stability. I want what is meant, not what was asked for. Okay? Now, some of you might recognize this sport. Anybody? Uh huh. Anybody remember this match? Opening match. Opening match. 2010. Um, what's a sign of a good team on the pitch? Who, anybody play football? Know what football is? Heard of it? Maybe see people running around and you always wonder what they're chasing? It's a little round ball. Size five. Okay. What, what makes a team good? Those that are what? Those that can score. Ooh, I like it. Let's play out a scenario. I'm not allowed to leave the stage. Let's imagine this. Let's, I, so I, I played through school. <coughs> I was always a defender. What's my job as a defender? To? To defend. Your job as a forward? To score. Yeah, you're the striker. Your job is to score a goal. So imagine it's a corner kick for us. Ball's down there. What's your name? Well, Fenton says to me, because he's our forward, hey, Mitch, get your ass down here. Why? Dude, it's a corner kick, man. We need all the people we can. No, 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 no. You crazy? Man, my job's a defender. I don't go on the attacking side. I'm going to stand right here, and I'm going to wait for the ball to come to me. When the ball comes to me, I'll kick it back to you. You do whatever in the hell you want. Your job is to score. If we lose, it's all your fault. I'm doing my job. I'm going to stand here. I think France might have had that experience at one point. Okay? That is a, that is a team that is, that is destined to burn in the ashes over and over and over again. Because, again, we don't have communication. We don't have trust. We don't have feedback. We don't have anticipation. We don't have any of that stuff that we talked about. Now, that's all fine and dandy, you might say. And you might go, but our culture won't allow for it. Our culture, our culture, our culture. Another C word. I like this book. Anyone read this book? Tribal Leadership? Good. If not, go buy it. Or, or don't. You know, go steal somebody else's. Um, but it's fun looking at this, right? So it describes on how to assess performance and culture. It breaks it down into, sorry, five stages. There we go. <laughs> All right. I feel like I should be playing Jeopardy music. Everybody's taking pictures. Oh my God, look at that. Doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, so stage one. Okay, stage one. People are hostile. Life is unfair. Life sucks. Stage two. We're passive. We're passive aggressive. We're agnostic. We don't care. We're sarcastic. Right? We're resistant to change. It's not my fault I'm not successful. It's your fault because you're my boss. Man, if you weren't my boss, life would be good. You know, my life sucks. Stage three. I am the smartest person in the room, clearly, because I have the microphone on. Kidding. Right? But you know these people, right? It's my way or the highway. This is my teenager mindset. I'm the rock star. I'm the lone wolf. I'm the guy who's going to save the day. Look at how awesome I am. Let me stand on the corpses of my dead teammates. 
and highlight my success. Oh, you're still alive? I'm terribly sorry. Let me squish you a little harder. Okay? I'm great. You're not. And we start seeing a little more positiveness, right? Hey, work's kind of fun. I like work. You're actually kind of cool people. You know, except for Oz, because he took us out, and he was supposed to take us out so long, screwed everything up, and he's not even here to hear me bag on him, which is fantastic. Ah, oh, damn it. He's here, right? We have shared values. We hold each other accountable. So now think about, think about a soccer team. Think about a football team out there on the pitch, right? You don't see the coach yelling, hey, you did that wrong. You see the fellow team members self-managing the game. They're holding each other accountable, right? We're great, you're not, which is fine. We're great, you're not. And then stage five. This is kind of the utopia. This is kind of the been there, done that, got the t-shirt. You know, I had the season pass to Disneyland and I went every single day because, you know, who needs work when you can spend $10,000 at Disneyland? Right? Life is great. Life is great. So, let's run a little survey here. Um, think about your current team or company. Do we remember stage one? Stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five? Of course not. That's a lot of memory things. And, you know, it's friggin' late in the day. Who's going to remember all this crap? All right, stage one, life sucks. Anybody in life sucks? My company, my project, my team, life sucks. Two, nice. Thank you for the courage and honesty. I won't call you out specifically, Oz. All right. <laughs> How about stage two, right? My life sucks. Anybody in the my life sucks, right? It's like, I'm resistant to change. The system's holding me back. It's not my fault, blah, blah, blah. Nobody's here. Good. Oh, we had a couple, okay. How about stage three, knowledge hoarders? I'm a teenager. I'm right, you're wrong. I will step on your dead corpse. Of course, you don't want to admit that because people are going to be like, oh my gosh, I work with you? I didn't know this was you. Right? But maybe you know somebody in the category of, I'm great, you're not. Anybody know somebody in that category? Should be a lot. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of hands up right now. Okay? Um, stage four, people are excited to work together. We benefit for our company, for our organization. We're great, they're not. So this is where we're starting to see Agile sort of taking hold, maybe, or some good team dynamics. We can actually see the forest through the trees. We're doing a good job. And then stage five, any, any here? Oops. One. Okay. Two. Two. One-person companies don't count. So, all right. So if you go through and you read the book, right, Life Sucks 2% or Less, which was similar to what we had here. My Life Sucks. There was some of that here. But the big one, I'm great, you're not. The vast majority of you, of course it wasn't you, but you know people like this. <laughs> right? And then we had a small subset of we're great, and then of course life is great. We had a small subset of that. Now here's the thing, right? The, uh, the authors of this book contest, they say, a stage five will outperform stage four, which will outperform stage three, and so forth down the line. But they grow exponentially. So I'm going to tell you a little story in a minute, but they grow exponentially, right? The difference between a stage three and a stage four is huge. The difference between a stage four and a stage five is huge. Key differences being here, stage three, I'm great. Stage four, we're great. Shared values and accountability versus I'm the expert, I know everything, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to maintain my tribal knowledge to my benefit versus to our benefit. So again, knowledge is power. Sharing is power. Stage three, stage four. Oh my gosh, you're like, seriously, where's my beer? Isn't he done talking yet? No, 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 there's only two more parts. I promise, time's it, Peter. Ten to what? Scheiße. I am terribly sorry. Scheiße is shit. <laughs> In German. We're almost done. All right. Business agility starts with two things. Number one, shared values, shared beliefs. And you know, that's hard to do. Super easy to say. We need to have shared values. We need to have shared beliefs. That's fine. Um, consider this. Okay? So imagine you walk into a building, very large company. This one happened to be in the United States. Walk in, you're like, cool, what am I getting into? And you, you see these things hanging on the wall, and you're like, yeah, friggin' awesome. I love integrity, because integrity is awesome. And communication, I totally value communication, especially when it's open and honest. 
It's not riddled with lies like, yes, I will be done at 445. Whoopsie. Excellence, yes, of course, we always strive for excellence because who doesn't love some good old excellence? And then, of course, respect. Respect for your fellow, whatever you're respecting. Now tell me, has anyone heard or seen anything similar to these in companies you've worked at? Yeah, anybody know the source of this? It's a little-known company called Enron, who decided to defraud their shareholders of billions and billions of dollars through bad accounting practices and through failed projects. They just made everything look fantastic. And then they ended up in jail because, you know, what's a good set of values on the wall when you don't follow them? Who gives a crap? So, you know, you can't pay lip service to this sort of thing because the source matters. So, as I was prepping for all this, I, I talked to a buddy of mine. Um, he, his name is Jim Newkirk. Anybody know Jim? Jim Newkirk, developer lore, created NUnit. Heard of NUnit, XUnit? Any of my dev friends might know that. Anyway, he decided to skip the Agile Manifesto meeting because he was frustrated, and I'll let him tell that story because it's his story. So I said, so you were, you were a VP of engineering at this company called Tier 3, and they, it was a cloud services company. They got, out by, they got purchased by a company called CenturyLink. CenturyLink wanted to expand their cloud offering, turned into CenturyLink Cloud. I had a ton of friends who worked here with Jim because we all sort of follow Jim because Jim's awesome. And I asked him, I said, what do, you make, what do you make all this business agility crap? And he goes, well, and we, and we talked a little about it, and I said, well, how did you do it at Tier 3? Because, you know, Jared's, Jared Ray started the company. You know, he brought you in, and, and it was just fun. I mean, I would go visit them, and it was just fun. You could feel the energy. It was clearly a stage five type thing. It just, nobody wanted to leave. Everybody held each other accountable. It was a good time. And he gave me a, a, a wonderful answer that we laughed at, which was it was pure luck. And I said, oh, dude, seriously, you got to be spoken crap because it wasn't pure luck. I said, what was it? And he goes, well, I said, tell you, before you answer, let me tell you how I approach this. Here's what I look for, right? I look for competencies, traits, behaviors, things like accountability. Are people accountable? Are they accountable to, I don't know, themselves, to their projects, to their teams, to their companies? Are they accountable? Do they have collective ownership? Do they, are, they, are they a team player? Do they, do, are they scoring goals and defending, or is it just, this is my job? Are they humble? Do they have humility? Can they, can they step back and go, yeah, I'm terribly sorry. Can they feel bad for something, one or others? Are they mature? Right? Now, maturity is a questionable thing, especially for us adult males, because we're all secretly 12. Sorry, guys, I screwed it all up, okay? And then, and then the last thing for me is, you know, good enough. Good enough doesn't exist. There's no good enough. It's, you know, to quote Yoda, do or do not. There is no, there is no try. Do or do not, there is no try. So I said at the end of the day, you know, what I really care about is I want to see things like this. I want to see empowered people who can make decisions. I want to see, come on, I want people to understand their role and how we're working together in our combined effort towards the vision and the goal that hopefully that good, strong leadership team is setting. And then operate as one. Because our true measure of success might not be working software, but it is definitely customer satisfaction. If our customers are happy, we're happy. And we're probably delivering on something that is of value, that where we have a good structure, where we're probably in that four and five range if we go back to the tribal knowledge, and we have those teams of teams established. And so I went, all right, so seriously, Dude, you gotta help me out. How'd you do it for realsies? What do you look for? I, I told you what I think. What do you think? What do you think? And he goes, here's the way I look at it. That, that is totally unreadable. I am terribly sorry. Um, he says, I bring in people who embody our values. I don't care what their skills are, as long as, as, long as the, the way they think is good. I let them do whatever they need to do to deliver. And and then they will bring in other people who were driven by those same values, and we don't accept laziness. And I'm like, yeah, 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 man, we all agree on this, but what's the one word? Like, how, I, I can give these talks to these people, and they're going to want, they're going to like, what's the one word, right? What do I say to my boss when I'm in the elevator and I got 30 seconds? What do we have to have at our company in order to make all this shit work? Discipline. If you don't have discipline, you don't have anything. So again, I got high cholesterol, I got high blood sugar. 
If I have the delicious little pastry for breakfast, I don't have a beer later on at the end of the day. I mean, I could, but my body's going to process that sugar the same way. And I don't want to have high blood sugar, and I don't want to be a diabetic, even though I'm not. I don't want to go down that path, so i got a choice to make. Do I have this, or do I have this? Or do I maybe have nothing, which is probably even the better choice, according to my wife. How do I stay disciplined? Because I'm faced with these things all day long. And if we say, well, you know, we got stuff to do and we're busy and all this stuff, it all gets in the way, you know, it's hard to get started. So how do we get started? I'm going to give you a little cheat sheet here on Denning's book, The Art of Agile. Anybody read this yet? Go read this. Okay, so Aaron, who's in here, he's a friend of mine. We, he, he's a good guy. He's at Microsoft still. Um, Law of the Small Team. Law of the customer, and then law of the network. The network, to me, is the team thing. We already sort of talked about that, so that'll be a recap. So let's take a look at these. And I promise your beer is coming soon. Right, Peter? You guys all know Peter? Peter's awesome. I like Peter. Work in small batches. Don't boil the ocean. You know, keep it small. Keep it simple. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Just small batches. Oz gave me the bag of candy. I didn't shove the whole bag of candy in my mouth. Small batches. I like small batches, okay? Have small cross-functional teams. For some of you, you're going to be like, yeah, but uh, that's a lot of work. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, welcome to life. Limit the work in process or limit the work in progress. So coming out of Kanban. Limit, Limit the whip. Don't try to do 20 things at once. Prioritize, whether it be a project portfolio, whether it be a team backlog. Prioritize that stuff and get it done. And establish autonomous teams that are free to do what they need to do to get stuff done. And I don't mean kind of done. I don't mean like chicken that's still raw on the inside. If I'm at a restaurant and they're like, here, here's your chicken. I'm like, awesome. And I cut into it. It's still raw. I'm like, what the hell is this? we'll, We'll cook the inside later. We're busy multitasking right now. We don't have time to do that. So, sorry. Um, Work without interruption. Yeah, isn't that a blessing? Working without interruption. Facilitate daily stand-up meetings. Have them. Have those daily plans. Raise those impediments, those issues, those challenges. Share information. You know, Denning's practice radical transparency. Be open, even if it hurts. Remember, data is just data. Separate the emotion as much as you can. It's hard to do. Collect customer feedback, which is really easy to do if you're focusing on getting to done. Because now you could show people things and say, I heard what you said. Is this what you meant? And then they'll hopefully say yes, but they'll probably say no. So respond to change. And then, of course, conduct retrospectives. Now, how many of you do retrospectives? Okay. How many of you know you should be doing retrospectives but don't? Thank you for the honesty. Here's the way I think about retrospectives. If there's one thing on this list you're going to do, you're going to do that one. Screw everything else. Dead serious. Because if you don't do that retrospective, you'll never figure out why you're sitting in the pressure cooker that you're sitting in. This is a safety relief valve. If you just break the valve and ignore it, it's like the problem doesn't go away. Shit's going to explode later. Boom. And then all of a sudden people are going to, oh my gosh, that was terrible. What happened? I shouldn't have said that word. We'll bleep that out on the video. People will say, what happened? I don't know, but we didn't have a retrospective because we were too busy... We, we, uh, too busy to make change, too busy to inspect and adapt, too busy to figure out what was going on, and of course now our customers feel that pain. So part two, law of the customer. Know who we're building for and constantly experiment. If you have to partner with startups, that's fine. Partner with startups, right? Break the not invented here mindset. Product malleability. Now, I read this one in the book, and I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work. Because what, what his theory is is that He uses a a hardware example. Shift from a hardware example to a software example. At least I haven't seen it work. Because software is easy to update. Software is easy to scale. Software is easy, easy, easy. Well, what do you do if your job is to build hardware, durable medical devices, test equipment in the field? Eh. So, you know. um, Focus, design on the simplest thing possible. Find that MVP. We've all heard that term, right? MVP? Good. Yeah, find that MVP. Innovate in short stages and gradually enhance and expand that MVP over time. Evaluate and test all the time. And not just, I mean, I I read this as, he talks about this as functionality. 
I think about this is I'm, we're testing ourselves as an organization. We're testing ourselves as a company. We're testing ourselves on how we choose to work. So test everything. Test everything. And be willing to disappoint. It's better. I, I'm a forgiveness person. I would rather ask for forgiveness than permission because if I ask for permission, I'll never get it. If I ask for forgiveness, yeah, well, terribly sorry, sir. Didn't mean for that to happen, sir. Please accept my apology. And off we go. Okay? Deliver value faster. And the last one, customize. Now, short story, because I know we're over. A friend of mine builds software that uh, companies use, chat help software. They have forked their branch multiple times for multiple customers. And as a result, they have to maintain 20 code branches. You want to make an update to this? You're updating it 20 times. And oh my gosh, do not fall into this trap. So I hear this, and I'm like, let customers tweak stuff. Yeah, if your job is to do one thing for one customer ever only. So, you know, Steve and I were on the board of, this, of the Scrum Alliance at the same time. I need to ask him this, what he meant, because I read it and I did not understand it. So, and then we have the law of the network, right? Create a network of teams that work together with the same energy as the members of a small team. And you know when you've been on a small team and it's been good and we're in that five to seven, eight, range and it's like, yeah, this is awesome. That's the energy we have to carry forward. Like that complex flock of birds so that we're able to react, so that we're able to adapt, so that we're able to adjust, and so that we're able to deliver. So, we're five slides away from beer. Have shared values. You, your company, right? or you, your team, your company, or your project, your team. I suck. Start at the top and then go to the right. Clockwise is hard. Clockwise is hard. You, your team, your project, your company. Shared values. Okay? Come on. Recognize and reward individuals whose actions demonstrate said values. And more importantly, hurry up because I'm going to click it. There we go. More importantly, don't recognize or reward people who don't. Create a behavioral change. And so I de-emphasize practice. I emphasize value. We collectively work together. We get those teams of teams. We acknowledge the fact that we're in a complex system that we're trying to adapt. And how quickly do we want to do it? Thank you. Your Honor, Your Honor. Well, thank you, Miss. Yeah, come on now. Before you get that beer, I'm sure you've triggered a few things in our minds, and there are going to be a few questions or comments. Concerns? It is 5.01, so you are officially free to leave, what? because, you know, before there was a control mechanism in place, which was the people standing outside the door with a cattle prod who would have said, Psst, get back in there, it's not over yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll take one burning question, if there is. One random question. Anybody have a random question? No. Age of the universe, why Star Destroyers are shaped the way they are. Okay, so um, I, I guess these are beer questions then. How warp Th fields that, work. That, that you're going to get, yeah. Help me to... Thank you. Applaud. Thank you. Thank you.